one of the major ironies of how Buddhism has come to the West is how the teaching on dependent core arising has been turned into a teaching on interdependence or interconnectedness. With the original teaching, the emphasis was in how things fit together and end up causing suffering. Whereas the new teaching is something to celebrate. It's good that everything works together. Everything fits together. We're all interdependent. We're all interconnected. And it's a lovely, comforting thing. But when you really look at things, the way things are interconnected, it's hard to see much to celebrate. The fit is always kind of loose, awkward, and there's still a lot of pain and suffering. Extra water vapor coming off the Atlantic has now driven up oil prices all over the United States. It's, it's a weird string of connections. Or you don't have to, have to look that far afield, just look at your own body, how things are connected in the body. See how the human body is constructed, the back. As you grow older, you begin to realize how poorly designed the human back is. If there's a designer, it's not a very intelligent design. Or if there is an intelligence behind it, it's a malicious intelligence. It's designed for pain. It's designed to fall apart. Or you look at how human beings are born. You start with sex, which requires a lot of lust, but then lust, whoever designed lust, if there was a designer, was pretty malicious because lust is something you can't control. You start lusting after the wrong people, which is what most people seem to do most of the time. And lust doesn't only create babies, it also leads to murder, leads to all kinds of problems. And yet it's an essential part of the mix to keep things going. And then there's pregnancy, all the pains that a woman goes through bearing a child. In Thailand, before each ordination, traditionally they would have a afternoon-long chant. Somebody would be hired to chant, a layperson would be hired to chant to remind the young monk candidate of all the suffering that his mother went through in raising him, and say the chant lasts for about three hours. Well, two and a half of the hours are focused on those nine months, nine months of morning sickness, nine months of something kicking in her stomach, and then there's birth. All the suffering, they said the most extreme pain that a human being can endure is the pain of giving birth. If there's a design behind all this, if there's an intelligent design, it's a, it's a malicious intelligence. So this is the world we're born into. This is how we're born. And it required a Buddha to come with some compassion and intelligence, seeing all this interconnectedness and saying, is there a way that we can use this, these interconnected things, these dependent things, to find a way out of the, su the suffering? That's what he gave his life to, both in the finding and in the teaching. And as we see, it's a very fragile teaching. You look at Buddhist history and everywhere it goes. People find all kinds of ways of trying to d divert the teaching to other purposes, forgetting that its original purpose was the most compassionate, showing the way out of suffering. Our imagination is so tied up with the normal way of using connectedness or interdependence that it really has trouble negotiating that compassionate use. This is why the path is so hard. It goes against the grain. If there's anything to call into question the idea of an intelligent designer or of a compassionate designer, it's the fact that the, the quest for an end to suffering, a quest for true and lasting happiness, goes so much against the grain of the human mind.
So keep that in mind as you practice. It's to be expected that things are going to go against the grain. And because the tools we're working with are tools that normally fit into another purpose, which is simply the survival of the body, it's very easiest to get off track. But if you can keep in mind the fact that deep down inside your deepest desire is a desire for happiness. A happiness that's not going to change on you, a happiness that's not going to leave you in a lurch. A happiness that doesn't have to involve other suffering. That was the desire that the Buddha himself respected within himself, and he respected that within other people. This is why he searched for this path, and when he found it, this is why he taught it. It was to speak to that specific desire. And there's so much in the world that tells us that it's unrealistic, or it's too much trouble. And all those other voices that are ready to pounce on any problems that come up in the practice. But if you can keep that little fire burning inside, see if there's any sense to this life at all, it lies in finding a true happiness. Always try to protect that. Do what you can to maintain it. Use your intelligence to sidestep any discouragements that come up. After all, this path is made out of conditioned things, so there are times when it seems like everything comes crashing down. And you have to put it all together, all over again. But the thing is, it can be put together again. And whether it comes crashing down, it, whether it's going to snuff out that little flame, is really up to you. And a lot of your survival of the times when there are bad periods in the path is to keep that long vision in mind. And to remember the nature of this path. It's a constructed path. It's a fabricated path. It leads to something unfabricated. But the path itself is a fabrication, which means it's dependent on conditions. And some, some, sometimes the conditions aren't all that they could be. But we do have this intelligence within us that can learn how to make the best of difficult things, poor things. hammer things together in a new way. So when they talk about strength on the path, it's composed of five things. First, there's the conviction that there's got to be a way out of suffering. And then secondly, there's persistence, sticking with that conviction, acting on it, being mindful to keep that conviction in mind all the time and then apply it to all your actions. Concentration and discernment. The discernment there is to help find ways over the obstacles that we all inevitably find on the path. And the concentration is to give you food, to keep the energy up. They talk about persistence being a requisite for concentration. Well, it goes the other way around as well. Do your best just to Stick with one object. When everything else seems to be crazy in life, just say, okay, I'm going to stay right here. If I don't know anything else for sure, what you, I do know for sure is that the breath is now coming in, the breath is now going out. Let's just hang out right there for the time being. And that way you can weather whatever crisis comes up, and it gives you the strength to deal with them, to recover. I was reading recently about how they've done studies about major disasters and catastrophes, huge hurricanes, earthquakes, fires. They've noticed how people immediately after a catastrophe like that, there's this bizarre sensation of euphoria, a sense of purpose as everybody drops in normal concerns and bands together to, to rebuild, to recover. And then after a while, once things get back to normal again, then everybody goes back to their old ways. And one researcher pointed out that there's a kind of a suspension of time 
of people's normal narratives stop functioning at that time. And there's a sense of liberation from that. And as you've got a common purpose, you've got an immediate purpose. In fact, one of the researchers said it sounded a lot like Buddhist meditation to them. The idea of dropping the narrative of the past and the future and just hanging out with the present moment. Finding a purpose in the present moment. And that gave a kind of buoyancy to the, the rebuilding efforts. Well, try to use that same attitude when your meditation comes crashing down. You've got some rebuilding work to do. It gives you a purpose, and it's something you can focus totally on the present moment. And the best way of doing that is dropping the whole narrative that's driving you crazy, the fact that things seem to be going well and all of a sudden they've crashed. Or it's been a gradual crash, however it crashes. It doesn't really matter. What matters is you realize, okay, just forget about the narrative and focus on the present moment. That's all you're responsible for. That's all you have to worry about. And you'll find that that will give you the buoyancy, it'll give you the energy you need in order to start the rebuilding work. So again, what you're using here is the process of dependent core rising, but you're pointing it in a new direction. This is one of the suttas where the Buddha talks about what someone has called transcendent core, dependent core rising. It's the typical pattern starting with ignorance and going through craving, ending up in suffering. And then the normal reaction to suffering, as the Buddha once said, is a combination of bewilderment and search. You're bewildered about why this particular type of suffering is happening and searching, hoping that somebody else will know, know a way out. And what usually happens is the the bewilderment is simply more ignorance, the search turns into more craving, and that leads to more suffering. But there are times when that search turns into a solid conviction. There must be a way out, and you're going to work and do whatever is needed to find that way out. You've reflected on life. As I said, the, the design, if there is a design, it's, it's not compassion at all. It's, all you have to see is someone go through the process of aging and illness and death. And you see how, if there's a design, how harsh the design is. But more likely, it's just, just the way things happen to be. And you see that, and you've got to reflect on the fact there must be a way out of this. And you've got the Buddha and his noble disciples to say, yes, there is. And we're fortunate we have their testimony. Their testimony is, is like a challenge. Are you up for the challenge? If you're not up for the challenge, then you're going to have to suffer like everybody else. If you are up for the challenge, where you're going to suffer, but it'll be in a different way. It's a suffering that leads to the end of suffering. So make the most of this opportunity, because it doesn't come along all that often. <laughs>